Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Eric Holm, Carmine Bailey, and Vince Power. Coming up on DTNS, how algorithms can help save lives in the ER, NFT sales decline, but also get more popular, and more tech jobs are going to folks without bachelor degrees. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, April 12th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And your backyard pit master, Big Chris Ashley. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We have got a show for you today, so let's get right into it with a few tech things you should know. COVID lockdowns in Shanghai and Kunshan have caused Pegatron, Quanta, and Compal to suspend factory activity. Pegatron makes about 20 to 30% of all iPhones. Quanta is the world's biggest laptop manufacturer with Dell and HP as key clients. 20% of its laptop capacity is in Shanghai. Compal makes laptops and tablets, including the iPad. Hundreds of companies have had to halt production in the Shanghai and Kinsman areas. Exceptions include iPhone assembler Luxshare ICT, which is still operating in Shanghai on a closed loop basis, meaning the staff is quarantining at work. Foxconn has done the same. A new report from the Interactive Advertising Bureau and PricewaterhouseCoopers says digital ad revenue in the U.S. jumped 35 percent to $189 billion last year, a much larger rise than the 12% growth rate of 2020. This year-over-year growth is also the highest the digital ad market had seen since 2006, with advertising on digital audio, like podcasts and streamed music, growing the fastest, up 58% to reach $4.9 billion. Vivo announced its first folding phone called the X Fold with an 8.03 inch folding screen on the inside and a 6.53 inch screen on the outside. Comes with two ultrasonic in display fingerprint sensors, one for each screen. Vivo also claims that a small panel in the hinge pushes up and flattens out the crease to make the screen appear smooth when unfolded. It's starting at about 9,001, around 1,413 US dollars for 12 gigabytes of RAM and 256 gigabytes of storage with a 512 gigabyte model going for 10,001. Meta is testing ways to let folks make money in the metaverse platform Horizon Worlds. A handful of Horizon creators will be able to sell virtual items as well as access to VIP sections with Meta receiving a cut, of course. U.S. creators with the most engaging worlds will also be able to earn money from a $10 million creator fund, uh, something Meta has done on Facebook in the past, too, where they just try to fund people to get them interested. This feature is meant to compete with Roblox and Rec Room which already allow creators to make money. A mobile version of Horizon Worlds is also expected sometime later this year. Plex is ending support for podcasts starting on Friday, April 15th, a feature that's been available since 2018. Maybe just not widely used. Plex is also removing the dedicated web show section, but it says that most of the content will be available in a different part of the app. I feel like that's saying them admitting that podcasts are a mobile thing and Plex is more of a sit-down thing yeah, yeah probably yeah. all right uh, let's talk a little more about this news about jobs and, and uh, folks being able to get tech jobs easier what do we got chris yeah so according to the wall street journal management consulting firm oliver wyman says that over the past two years a tenth of people in the u.s have left low paying hourly positions for higher paying skilled tech jobs linkedin's current population survey sees a similar trend the journal calls these former blue collar workers new collar. Catchy. Mm. We all know that digital demand has boomed over the last two years. There has also been a sharp reduction in immigration and an increase in retirement. And people have been leaving their hourly jobs because of the pandemic. So on the other, on one hand, you have people leaving restaurants, warehouses, manufacturing, and hospitality. And on the other hand, you have big tech companies having a hard time filling roles. As a result, many companies are dropping requirements like a college degree or prior work experience. According to the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, the number of jobs that paid above the national median without requiring a bachelor's degree rose by 2.3 million during the pandemic. Examples include Okta, 
which removed college degree requirements for some sales positions last year and formed a business development associate program to train candidates on the job. Another example is Flatiron School, which offers a coding boot camp that costs $15,000 and in nine months can get you a software engineering certificate. Finally, LinkedIn says that completions of classes that result in a certificate rose 1300% between 2020 and 2021. So if you take these at face value, Chris, uh, it, it does look like there's uh, a lot of pressure to open up hiring because there's a shortage of, of qualified workers in some creative ways. But as you were telling me uh, earlier today, uh, that's not news to you, huh? No, no. And I, there's so much to unpack in this story. So I'm, I'm glad we have this one today because first off, you know, more power to anything that progresses people forward in life. I love that because it's my own story in this article, right? Um, you know, I started out working in restaurants, as many people have heard me talk about, and then I got burned out from working in the restaurants and I wanted a mindless job and I just started driving a truck. And then within six months, I was like, all right, this is not enough. I need something else. And a position opened up at the company I was working for where they just wanted somebody to build computers. And they, they what they were doing was they were transforming this company's uh, systems from the old, you know, connected DOS systems to, to something that was web connected. And, you know, the, the guy that they hired to do this had a lot of vision and when I got in, the first, my first day on the job was the Melissa virus. And they're like, forget building computers. Sit down here. Uh, we know you don't have any experience. We know you don't know anything but driving trucks. Sit down here, follow this script, and we'll teach you how to do this stuff. Um, just You just need to do these things. And from there, you know, now I work for, you know, a software company. Uh, and, and it just, yeah, I was able to get in. And then we were able to say, oh, wow, they're just taking people without any experience, any college degree or anything. Let me get a couple of buddies in here. And, you know, these type of situations become life changing for people when you can get into a, a, a job like this that pays you significantly more money, but mm -hmm. offers you some you know, some additional skills more than your hands on skills, but stuff that you can really then take anywhere you want and parlay that into something else. So I love the fact that if the, just as fast as the inter, when the Internet started to blow up and I, you know, I was a lucky with circumstance, you know, although I you know, made the best of my opportunity, it kind of went away. Uh -huh. and, and then all of a sudden it became, you need 800 different degrees. You need 1000 uh, certifications or we're not hiring. We don't even want to look at you. We don't, you know, and I, I tell people it was a wild, wild west back then, you know, like I had a buddy that would actively change jobs every three months. Cause every time he changed job, it was an extra $20,000 he made, you know, so it was crazy. So seeing this, yeah, I, it'll probably never go back to those days, but I love the fact that folks that just need an opportunity have potentially an avenue to get that opportunity. I mean, we've talked on GDI recently about, you know, the idea of, you know, having a college degree. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. What does that mean? Um, I just, I don't know. I, 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 I feel like in this story in particular, the idea that someone would have been denied a job that would get them more money because they didn't have a certain degree uh, is feels really antiquated. But it but it's a weed out factor. If, if you notice, Chris, even though there's a virus in both of these stories, uh, it's a different kind of virus. Uh, in Chris, Chris's story, it was because of the dot com boom. There were so many companies; they were having a hard time finding people. And so they had to loosen up and be like, okay, can yep. you do it? Do you have the potential to do it? Are you somebody mm -hmm. who, who can learn this? Great. Then we'll have you do it. Same thing's happening now. Uh, they're saying we don't have enough people out there. So let's look at skills. Let's look at like who's got talent versus who's got a degree. When you have more people applying than you have job openings, that's when the walls go up and they're like, well, we need to weed out these things. So let's, yeah. let's require them to have a certificate. Let's require them to have a degree. I, it's, it's just a, a matter of the times, I think more than anything. Well, and the big question has always been, you know, is you, you're weeding out, but what exactly are you weeding out? You know, are you weeding out, you know, just to get something that fits your checkbox? Or are you weeding out potential? So when I moved into actually doing on, on, on the software side and I met with the, uh, the, uh, my, my boss, we went out to dinner and he said, listen, 
I see, you know, you work on a help desk and you have some good experience working in active directory and stuff like that. But I, I can teach anybody the software. I can't teach you personality and I can't teach you the willing, the willingness to learn. And if you have that, you'll fit in great. You know what I mean? And yeah, so yeah. he, you know, again, so it was the second time in my life, somebody gave me an opportunity to, to move forward, you know? Yeah. And of course I was grateful and went in and, you know, became one of the top system engineers in, in the company as far as deals wise. So I love the fact that, uh, perhaps there is an opening here, at least for the, you know, the next, you know, foreseeable future, at least that there's some opportunity coming where folks who may not have gotten a look will get that look. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm a little, I always hold a little bit back in my excitement because, you know, I don't know what is the, you know, there's always a chance that this was a article to just promote something. I don't know what, but I'm just saying, but it sounds good. And the fact that there's data points coming from multiple yeah, yeah. Uh, different uh, people, Flatiron, you know, uh, LinkedIn, you know, all these folks are coming out with stuff uh, with kind of following the same uh, mindset and uh, information. I, I love this. So, I, you know, because this is how I got my start in the industry and um, was able to parlay it into being on DTNS, uh, I, you know. You, you, <laughs> the <laughs> pinnacle of your career. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, I, I, you know, this is this is good news. And yeah, 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 and, yeah. yeah for sure. Yeah, I, I, I think I hope I hope two things come away. I hope one is that weed out factor changes. They start to realize that like, oh, that was a bad weed out factor. We we found some great people uh, by not requiring all those certificates and degrees. Maybe we could figure out a different weed out factor if we have to tighten up. And the other thing is uh, the story. We didn't touch on it much here, but uh, a lot of people decided to try applying when they wouldn't have before because their job went away temporarily. The bar closed down, the restaurant shut up, uh, and they, were, they realized they wanted to have more flexibility over when and where they were working, uh, and so took more chances. And, and maybe that'll teach people to do that. Like, hey, you might get a job you don't think you can get, and, and you might love it. So uh, yeah. you know, I hope both those things become true. And that definitely lends into advice I've given to people in the past who are looking at applying for a new job, and they're like, what do you think? Should I go? I'm like... They, they're like, this is the requirement. I was like, forget the requirement. Go sell yourself. You know, yeah. if you let them know that you can do the job. And that you want it. Yeah. And you want it. Yeah. You know, and so, yeah. So for anybody listening, you know, if this gets you over the hump, it's like, hey, there's an opportunity out there. Go, go for it. Who cares if you don't get it? At least you tried. Well, speaking of wanting things, some people want NFTs. We know some of you are very enthusiastic about NFTs. Some of you are not enthusiastic mm, about true. NFTs. Well, we think all of you can benefit from knowing some of the hype free facts around NFTs. A TechCrunch story, which will be in our show notes, indicates that overall sales of NFTs are declining, but popular NFT sales are still rising kind of pointing to a consolidation of the overall market. Popular NFT owners are also finding new ways to generate revenue from those NFTs. So let's do the numbers. According to data aggregator CryptoSlam, NFT global sales, which topped out at $4.6 in January of this year, has fallen almost 50% to $2.4 billion by the end of March. However, popular products, projects rather, bucked that trend. In the last 30 days, Board Ape Yop Club rose 169%. Mutant Ape Yop Club rose 199.6%. I don't mean to laugh. They're just funny names. And Azuki rose 146%. Okay. These are popular NFT projects. And increasingly, NFT owners are using these projects as collateral to secure loans. Lending marketplaces Arcade and NFT Fi saw their combined loan uh, total loan volume increase 171% from Q4 of last year to 83.7 uh 83.17 million dollars in Q1 of this year. What do we think? It looks like the weaker projects are shaking out. 
that would be a market maturation, right? The popular stuff is getting more popular because people like it and it's good. And, and I'm not going to get into why NFTs are or are not good, but the market is saying, we like these, give us more of these, give us less of the overhyped stuff, the fraudulent stuff, you know, the stuff that's no good. And that is the sign of a consolidating and maturing market that's growing up. The loan thing, I don't know what to make of that. That could be also the sign of a maturing market where it's like, oh, these, these have enough solid potential that somebody's willing to post them as collateral. The loans are all in cryptocurrency, mostly in Ethereum. Uh, so it's in the universe. They're, they're not, you know, uh, buying a house, putting, putting an NFT up sure. for collateral yeah. for that. Uh, so that could also, that could, that could be a solid maturing market. It, it could also mean the end times where people are like, let's wring the last dollar out of this before it's all gone. <laughs> squeeze it all. Yeah. I don't know, Chris, what do you think? So the, this, the loan part is what is, is crazy to me. It's like, you, you really believe that this is, uh, a hunt, you know, so valuable that you can loan money on it and more power to them. I'm not saying one way or the other, whether they should or shouldn't, but you know, to me, I'm looking at this and I'm like, this is the same market where there was basically the new pet rock NFT. Uh, and you're giving loans out in that same, it's like, you know, is it not too soon? <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, I, if it takes off and provides opportunity for folks that le legit opportunities, Hey, you got you got no beef from me, but uh, I mean the whole thing with uh, NFTs, and I own zero of them uh, personally. But it seems like it's so. Um, if you, I don't know, I I I I think of this as like okay, if I go to a pawn shop and I give somebody something as collateral that has value, then you know we're we're making a deal here. But NFTs are so volatile that uh, mm -hmm. I I wonder how this is this is actually going to be a thing that is workable money wise going well, forward. I think that goes back to the first point of like yes NFTs are volatile, but some NFTs are more volatile than others, and yeah. we're starting to see the more volatile or the ones that just don't catch on shaken out, and so maybe Board Ape Yacht Club uh, is relatively stable. And therefore, like, oh, you've got a bored ape. Yeah, yeah. No, we can we can use that as collateral on a loan. You have, you know, what I have, Len Peralta's art. They might be less willing to give me a big loan on that. No disrespect to Len. It's just, you know, not quite as widely popular as, as Len right. would like. Uh, you know, and and then there's the like utterly fraudulent ones where they're gonna be like, Yeah, we're not giving you anything for that. So <laughs> it just kind of depends on on what you have. Yeah, I can't wait to I, I like this is something that kind of interests me just from a stand back and kind of watch something new emerge. So I, I'm all for watching it if these loans work out and p new uh, price points and things start to come come of this. Hey, you know, especially from the gaming side, which is the first story I you know we covered on it was where they were doing this in gaming. Um, I'm all for it. Yeah. And Beatmaster pointed out like Len Peralta could lend his NFTs everywhere len's about to get paid yeah please <laughs> somebody <laughs> pay len uh hey if you're feeling social if you're like hey tom never make a pun like that again even if beatmaster originated in the <laughs> chat room uh you can get in touch with us on the socials and let us know we are at dtns show on twitter and dtns picks with an x dtns pix on instagram <laughs> algorithms they, they get a bad name these days because most people think of Facebook's news feed uh, or some other social network or maybe an advertising network when you hear the word algorithm. But they're also being used for stuff that doesn't appear to erode trust in institutions. Automation and robotics is a good example, and not just autonomous cars either. For years, we've covered Miso Robotics. They make Flippy the burger bot for White Castle. They also make a tortilla chip maker bot for Chipotle. And most recently, they just announced a coffee pot minder for Panera Bread. So the Panera employees don't have to go check if the coffee's out. It just automatically refills it. Wall Street Journal has an overview of how algorithms are being used in emergency rooms and intensive care units, ICUs. Uh, there are, of course, the commonly reported uses of detecting cancer in radiology images, identifying candidate drugs for testing. But in the emergency room, algorithms are being trained on medical data to be able to identify warning signs for things like sepsis, cardiac arrest, and stroke. Uh, we're talking subtle things like 
detecting changes in temperature combined with respiratory rate and other vital signs, pulse, etc. Things that might get overlooked in a busy emergency ward, but when combined together, the algorithm says that's a bad sign. Uh, if you don't know, sepsis is an infection that can rapidly kill a patient that looked fine five minutes ago. Uh, but it's often hard to properly diagnose because the symptoms are common with other illnesses. You might come in for an illness that gives you high respiratory rate, high pulse rate, and that's also a, a sign that you have sepsis. So it's hard to tell. Duke University Hospital, however, is one of the places that improved its sepsis treatment compliance. That's basically the amount of times they were able to catch the disease and treat it. Uh, before it was fatal, from around 31% of cases to around 64% by using an algorithm called Sepsis Watch. That algorithm was trained on 42,000 inpatient encounters at Duke. Here's how it works. Every patient admitted into the hospital's emergency department gets analyzed by Sepsis Watch. Obvious cases are flagged immediately. Other cases are flagged as either high, medium, or low risk, and those are updated every five minutes. A rapid response nurse, so independent of the distractions of the ER, monitors these, and if a patient is flagged as either having sepsis or at high risk for it, they're referred to the attending physician to review and make a treatment recommendation. So the algorithm isn't doing the treatment, the doctor is. The algorithm's just flagging like, hey, you want to go look at this person right now. It's a form of triage, uh, so it makes sure that overworked nurses and doctors see patients that are most in need of their attention. HCA Healthcare's SPOT algorithm is similar. It detects sepsis six hours earlier on average than humans can and has reduced sepsis mortality across its 160 hospitals by almost 30%. HCA is also using the SPOT platform to develop models to detect shock in trauma patients, post-op complications, and other signs of early deterioration. Kaiser Permanente in California has a predictive model called Advanced Alert Monitor that detect patients that might deteriorate for any reason into a code blue situation. That's when everybody has to run in with the paddles. They can identify about half of those while they're still stable and intervene to keep them from going code blue, to keep them off life support. A study in the New England Journal of Medicine found that programs uh, that, that program led to fewer deaths, fewer ICU admissions, and shorter hospital stays. The key to all of this is to work with the caregivers to find out what they need and how they work and work with local records to develop your model. Models don't work as well if they're developed in one hospital and then just brought to another without accounting for the difference in demographics or if you don't update them with recent data. Medical algorithms are no exception to a common problem of training data being predominantly white European and therefore not working on populations that are predominantly black, Asian, Hispanic, or anything not white European. And even when you get the demo right, new data is essential. One example was the similarity of COVID symptoms to symptoms of sepsis, which caused a spike in false alarms for one sepsis model until it was updated with new data so it could differentiate COVID from sepsis. Uh, but Chris, I know you've unfortunately had to deal uh, with sepsis directly uh, in your family experience. How do you feel about all this? Yeah, so I was, I was sitting here trying to think, of like, what's the best way to articulate how awesome this type of development is to folks? Because, you know, the reality is not everybody uh, goes through something so tragic where they you, you even have to learn what sepsis is in the first place. But I actually had two brothers in the last couple of years who were spent significant time in the hospital. And... Uh, one, both of them ended up being septic at one point. Uh, one passed away. One was Sorry. able to, to thank you, was able to recover. And what you realize, first off, you come in, you know, folks listen to this as a tech show. And what you, what you kind of realize, and you, I, I kind of chuckle about it, is, you know, when I was working on a help desk, I would sit there and I'd be like, okay, let's stick to the last thing that changed. Let's, let's try this. Let's try that. And you're like, oh, doctors do the same thing. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, if you come across something constantly, then it might be the same thing. But a lot of times they're just troubleshooting like you would troubleshoot a computer issue. So when you can introduce something that can take all of these significant data points and then turn around and and be able to come to or help a doctor come to a conclusion much faster, you know, it, it, it's, it's just awesome to hear and to kind of see where this technology goes, you know, and as mentioned, you know, making sure that the data points cover a wide uh, array of people, you know, whether you're African-American, uh, Asian, Caucasian, whatever, um, making sure all of those things are covered because humans overlook that stuff. 
just based on their own personal experiences. But just seeing folks that are in the hospital and they come in for one thing, with, you know, happened to both my brothers and all of a sudden, you know, they it, it, it seems like it just comes out in both cases. It seemed like it came out of nowhere. It's like, yeah. oh, your, your brother's septic right now. We're pumping all these antibiotics. It and we're, in. Yeah. It, it just comes out of nowhere. Yeah. And then and you're like, okay, yeah, you made it through. And then he's gone stuff to kick in and, you know, going back and forth and the fight to see all of that stuff. And so when I see anything like this, you know, it, it makes me happy because I know what we went through as a family, seeing, seeing both of my, you know, your loved ones sitting there and just not responding. And, you know, and, and also just the fact that, you know, it sounds like a lot of this will be able to be done right from the room. Right. Because, you know, when they wanted to, do certain tests on my one of my brothers he was he was a bigger guy at the time and so but they couldn't get him into some of the machines because he was just so big you know what Mm. i mean so if they can find you know tech technological ways to do these things while they're in just on the way in and monitor these things and because you know it's, it's it's an awesome thing to see and i hope they you know really make some strides there yeah, I think uh, the the part of this that I, I think is the takeaway for me personally, you know, in thinking about this stuff uh, is it's not if you sit in in Silicon Valley and create a data set that can't be used everywhere. The, and and even if you're like, oh, well, the problem is it, it's too white. Let's put a bunch of black people. Well, that's not going to work everywhere. The key to this was if you're in the Duke hospital, use the population that attends that goes to the Duke hospital to build your model. Because then it's going to be most accurate for those people. And don't try to use the Duke one in Kaiser Permanente over in Oakland, because that's that's a different set of people. Uh, And, you know, just being local with your data set was incredibly important here. And I think that's that's a really interesting takeaway here. Yeah, very, very awesome. Well, you know, keeping keeping on the science theme, uh, you may have heard of protons. <laughs> Perhaps Proton. you've been in a physics class. <laughs> Those are the positive specs anchoring atoms. Then there are electrons. Those mm-hmm. are negative blips roaming around those protons. Then there are photons. That's what comes out of light bulbs. What about W boson, which in physics dictates what's called the weak force? If you haven't been in physics class lately, or you never have, allow me to try to explain. A paper, uh, a paper published last Thursday in the journal Science says that 10 years of precise data suggest that W boson particles are more massive than our physics have predicted thus far, which might be a problem because it introduces a paradox for the standard model of particle physics, which is how we define protons, electrons, photons, gluons, muons. For decades, the standard model has accurately predicted how su- su- subatomic forces work, except for gravity. So scientists have actually sort of hoped that they could find a flaw in the standard model, because that could be the key to developing a new unified model that could then bring in gravity and make it make sense. To understand the standard model, CNET's Monisha Revisetti suggests you imagine each particle in the model as a string, perfectly organized to tie everything together, but if anything gets too tight, the standard model predicts a few parameters for each string or particle, and a very important one is the W boson mass. If you want to get a W boson, you have to smash two protons together. So if the particle doesn't equal that mass, that becomes the first part of the model that has failed. And you might say, hmm, failure, but scientists don't like that. But in this case, they're actually kind of pumped about it because it helps them understand uh, the way this all works a little bit more. Yeah. The, the standard model has not been able to account for gravity, but it's never failed in a way that gave them an insight to be like, aha, this is the problem with the standard model, and now we can work in gravity. So if if this turns out to be the thing that they can use to like wrench open the standard model and figure out you know what's wrong with it, uh, that's great. That's good news. Uh, they kind of thought the Higgs boson was going to be that, and then the Higgs boson turned out to be a really boring value that was exactly what they would have predicted. And they're like, ah, shucks. Uh, so you know what? that's that's how physics works and the idea is they want to break the standard model so they can figure out how to rework it to unify all of physics this is pretty exciting actually you know with all the stuff people be worrying about every day (laughs) then they then they're like let me give you something else to worry about 
that you don't even understand. That's right. <laughs> Physics, as you know it, is broken. Yeah. I love this, but I'm going to give these scientists a shin kick. Keep this stuff to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> till, till it affects Chris. Right. 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 It, yeah. it, it, if, if I can't levitate, I don't want to know. All right. Uh, Chris, Chris Ashley, such a pleasure to have you on the show. Let folks know where they can keep up with everything that you do. Hey, you can always catch me and the homies on SMR Podcast. And this week, we are coming back with season two of Barbecue and Tech. Yes. Yes. Some more barbecue. Going to be a blast. So happy I'm here this week to kind of let folks know we come in. And uh, always a pleasure to be here. Well, it's always a pleasure to have you. Also, a pleasure to get new patrons, and we have one today. Our brand new boss name is Michael. Michael just started back at us on Patreon. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, we thought maybe uh, we'd hit another day without out a, a new boss, but Michael saved us. Thank you. you know, yeah, Michael, you you did save us. Uh, reminder tomorrow. for folks, there's a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet, available at patreon.com slash dtns. And DTNS itself is live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewshow.com slash live. We do this every weekday. We're going to be doing it again tomorrow. Scott Johnson, talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. You have enjoyed this program. <laughs>